Hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everybody joining us from around the world. It is with great pleasure that I extend a warm and hearty welcome to each and every one of you on behalf of CWC San Francisco Bay Area team. We realize that you could be anywhere at this time, but you chose to be here with us. And for that, we are so grateful. We are very excited to have received your love via almost 200 uh, registrations. And for those who are in other time zones, we will be sending you on-demand video shortly after our event. My name is Iru Puri, and I'm thrilled to serve as today's session coordinator. As a passionate advocate of holistic health, I'm devoted to making people's lives happier and healthier. Prior to this, I also worked as a software professional for over two decades. Let me explain today's session's format. So after I uh, give a quick introduction, we will invite Dr. Nancy, who will share her insights on uh, her research and the amazing work she has uh, been doing for a few decades now. And we also are so happy to have received your questions in advance. So we will spend time doing a Q&A with Dr. Nancy. And after that, we will taking live uh, questions via chat. So let me give you a quick introduction about CWC. For those who are new to the CWC wellness program, we provide a comprehensive and holistic approach to help you achieve wellness and balance in your life. On our platform, you will meet like-minded people. We also truly believe in making heart-to-heart -heart connections with each other so we can support each other, especially during challenging times in our lives. And how do we do this? by offering online and on-site events. And so far, we have had almost 200 online events. And we also have a Cushy app, which you can download on your smartphones and also sign up for free. And through this app, you will find many resources for our seven tracks and counting. You can also connect with our health heroes, join support groups, and take advantage of wellness products and services through our soon-to-be-launched Wellness Mart. And now, let me introduce you to Dr. Nancy. So Dr. Nancy Lonsdorf, she is one of the nation's most prominent doctors a popular speaker, author, teacher, and recognized integrative medicine expert who specializes in women's health. Over the past 25 years, she has treated nearly 20,000 patients. Dr. Lansoff has also lectured at some of the nation's foremost medical institutions, including the National Institutes of Health, John Hopkins, Columbia University, George Washington University, and also served on several editorial boards. I know I have only touched the tip of the iceberg, <laughs> and Dr. Nancy is a lot more than what I have been able to describe in these couple lines. But without further ado, let us now give a very warm welcome to our guest today, Dr. Nancy, and she will be sharing her work on brain health and various solutions and all her research. So with that, welcome, Dr. Nancy. Thank you so much, Iru. I really appreciate that wonderful, warm welcome. And I'm really excited to be here. Wellness is my favorite part about life. Um, I think we all would like to have more of it. 
And we all strive every day to fit in more self-care, more wellness uh, features into our daily routine. It's the cumulative effect of our everyday lifestyle choices that makes or break us our brain and our hearts and everything else as we as we so know as that saying goes if i knew i would live this long i would have taken better care of myself so <laughs> i just salute you all for bringing wellness to the forefront and supporting each other and providing so much useful education and resources and just mutual support is fabulous so thank you so much for having me the title of this is um you know why brain health and memory rejuvenation matter i think it doesn't take long to reflect that our minds memory our consciousness they're the most intimate part of us and our human incarnation and contain our whole life story, our relationships with those around us. And it all depends on the brain and how it's functioning. And there's probably nothing more frightening than the idea that somehow that, that continuity of self and consciousness that we have in this lifetime and our connections to people would be somehow disrupted because we just lose knowledge knowledge of who we are, where we are, who we're with. That, that is very frightening. So the really good news is that memory loss no longer has to happen. And it's no longer such a black box. It's no longer so um, generally, it's not like just a stroke of lightning. It hits randomly. But we're beginning to understand many of the processes and mechanisms by which the brain starts shutting down and neuronal function and therefore cognition and memory begin to be um, deteriorating and declined. And the good news about it is that a lot of it is actually preventable and even redeemable to a certain degree. And like just about everything in health, the earlier you start, the better the results. So that's why we're also talking about, you know, age 40. And even, you know, one of the first questions that came through the crowdsourcing was, well, what do we do for those of us before 40? And since the changes of Alzheimer's and markers appear as early as 40 years before any symptoms come up, I think there's plenty of room, no matter what age you are, and I am, and we are, that we can we can make some changes that will positively impact our brain health and therefore help preserve our cognition and our memory and our sense of self. So I have a few slides I wanted to show you just to give a little bit of background. Uh, maybe uh, many of you are familiar with some of these points, but I, I thought I would just go through and create a little bit of a common foundation and then dive into the many wonderful, excellent questions that you've asked. So I actually started with this uh, about five years ago, no, almost six years ago now, when I had the great good fortune to meet uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen at a training in uh, the Institute of Functional Medicine. And actually, I met his first patient uh, best friend first. And she had told me at a, at a dinner, I was just meeting her in San Diego. She told me the story of her best friend and how she had recovered from Alzheimer's. And knowing that I was a doctor, you know, she wanted me to know this and that I'm an integrative doctor. I didn't just brush it off as some kind of impossibility or couldn't have been right, or the diagnosis must have been wrong. Uh, but I was I was uh, inspired, but in a cautiously optimistic way, because really, I didn't know how that had happened, and I wasn't being empowered. So anyway, I did some training. I was fortunate enough six months later to do training in this methodology, and I've been using it with patients since then, uh, a number, probably somewhere between a 50 and 100 patients. And the results are sort of bell-shaped curve, as you can imagine, but it's not its not as hopeless as it used to be. And many people have had really good results. And we can see the influence of catching things early and 
really following a comprehensive approach to sustain memory as well as to help recover it. So we all know that Alzheimer's disease is a global epidemic. It's the fifth uh, leading cause of death for U.S. women. It's the number one cause of death in women in the U.K. And two-thirds of dementia patients are women. And this incidence increases, as we know, sharply with age. And after 85 years, a depressingly 50% of people have dementia. Currently, there is no known so-called cure. The medications that exist tend to be very limited in their effect. Maybe they slow progression for about six months. Some are actually being cited as creating more harm than good in the long run. And these new super expensive monoclonal antibody drugs are of questionable effectiveness in actually improving cognition, then they have serious side effects, even though they do get rid of amyloid. So here we have our beautiful brain and the hippocampus deep within the central part of the brain in the hippocampus. And that is something that we want to protect and we don't want it to shrink up as we get older. This would be example from left to right of the brain becoming less in volume. We want to nourish the brain so it stays nice and full as possible. This represents a lot of neuronal loss. So what causes Alzheimer's disease? Beta amyloid deposits uh, is said cause um, Alzheimer's. Tau tangles within the cells cause Alzheimer's, but really those are just the hallmark pathological features. We really don't know what causes those things to build up. And in integrative medicine, as you know, and Ayurveda and all natural approaches, we ask the question, you know, what is causing this? What can we do? So here is the schematic of tau tangles within the cell. You can see that these shrotas, those of you who know Ayurveda, this would be shrotas, these little, these channels have gotten, and passageways have gotten all tangled. And then outside between the cells in the in extracellular space, big clumps of this beta amyloid, which then disrupt the conduction along dendrites and axons and eventually cause the neurons to degenerate and then basically die off. So these were just some headlines I pulled out of um, the news in the last few years, like is Alzheimer's an infection? For example, like herpes simplex virus, or could it be uh, Lyme, chronic Lyme? Is Alzheimer's diabetes of the brain? That type three diabetes is now the name of this phenomenon. Does air pollution cause Alzheimer's? Is Alzheimer's caused by a virus? Is it caused by inflammation? Well, they all may play a role in different degrees in different people and many other mechanisms and theories abound. This is Dr. Dale Bredesen. He is the, um, really, I would say the pioneer of the integrative approach and applying it in a clinical setting. And he actually has spent his life studying in the lab at the Buck Institute of Aging primarily uh, as a bench scientist, just looking for that magic drug that's gonna cure Alzheimer's. And after several decades in his career, looking for it, having you know drug after drug that looked great in mice and then did not translate into really helpful in humans, uh, Dr. Ramhan Ra, one of his associates in the lab, and others said, hey, you know, there's a lot of research on all sorts of natural stuff coming out from, you know, exercise to diet to supplements to herbs and spices. You know, maybe we should look at that. And eventually they got to him and he said, yeah, OK, so let's put it all up on the wall. Every study you can find, let's look at it and try to figure out what way forward might work. And so he he basically said we should do it all. We need a comprehensive approach. So this was his first paper published in 2014 when he documented 10 patients that he had applied um, this model of optimizing metabolism, nutrition, reducing inflammation, optimizing blood sugar, optimizing nutrients and hormones, and addressing any infections, et cetera, et cetera. 
And he found really um, impressive results when I saw, I got very inspired when he presented this data on a particular patient showed in the beginning um, baseline fasting insulin 32, that's like diabetic or close to it. Uh, that's very high resistance, insulin resistance, high inflammation, almost 10. I mean, you want to see HSCRP ideally less than one homocysteine, which is also pro-inflammatory, vitamin D deficiency, struggling. He was somebody who used to be able to add two rows of numbers in his head, uh, many, many numbers. He couldn't remember his uh, locker combination at the gym. And his hippocampus was 17th percentile size for his age. Well, <clears throat> he did this protocol for not even a year and all of his metabolic markers dramatically improved. And his symptoms went, went basically away, went back to working full-time and his hippocampal volume, this was what got me. Oh, it went from 17th percentile to 75th percentile. It basically grew back. That was, that really was impressive to me that we had some objective anatomical data that showed that things are really reversing in the brain. Then he went on with some other clinicians to collect data on a hundred patients being treated by doctors trained in his protocol. And then the most recent published just last year, precision medicine approach to Alzheimer's disease, a su su successful pilot project. This was done on 25 participants. They were not randomized. It wasn't controlled. The control was the average um, that a general population of people with this mild cognitive impairment condition would go through in that nine months. He applied his comprehensive approach. 84% of the participants improved cognitively and as far as their MRI went, improved as well. So now they are going to do a multi-center trial and they are going to randomize it, which is really great. We want to keep adding up, upping the quality of the data. So this was the average cognitive scores and the percentile when the um, 25 participants started. And you said they went from below the 40th percentile for their age to up closer to the 66th percentile. So as opposed to no treatment or with these expensive drugs, the change in cognitive score that would have been expected in that time period would have been a, some decline and instead they had an improvement. And the MRI expected drop of 2.2% per year. And these people actually gained gray matter. Gray matter are the, the cell bodies, the neurons, the neuronal bodies themselves. So that was a very significant improvement for a nine month period. And the hippocampus, uh, it still was declining slightly, but at a rate about, um, you know, two thirds less than it would have otherwise been expected to. I won't go into all this detail, but it's very interesting that there is one molecule that we can look at that in a healthy brain, this beta amyloid um, precursor molecule, the precursor protein to beta amyloid, it sticks in the cells. It goes, it, it um, spans from the extracellular space through the cell membrane into the intracellular space. And it gets, it responds to the environment. It's very epigenetically triggered. So if it's a healthy environment, you know, really good, healthy nutrients coming in and low inflammation and all that, this thing can cleave into two and it actually supports the growth of new neurons. But if it's a bad environment or challenging environment or infection or in, um inflammation or lack of nutrition or lack of stimulation or stress or cortisol or imbalances in hormones, et cetera, et cetera, then it can, it, this same molecule gets cleaved differently by enzymes. And it goes on to make um, these beta amyloid fibrils that can accumulate. And it's not, I think Dr. Bredesen's approach and other experts are saying, you know, amyloid's a response of the body and the brain to challenge. And it's actually meant to be a protective response. But if it's in excess, then 
you know, then too much builds up. Those of you who know Ayurveda, I like to think of it as beta ama, amyloid. Ama is, you know, waste and purities and, and things that build up and then they clog the, the spaces and the channels in the body. And that's what Ayurveda says is basically the, the root, one of the first steps of physiological imbalance that leads to disease after the, the doshas. So it's kind of like a barometer. That's how I look at it. This precursor protein, you know, is the weather's going, uh, you know, going to be good, then it goes this way and everything grows. If the weather's starting to be bad, then it goes this way and everything kind of contracts. And our diet, as we said, epigenetically, diet lifestyle have a huge impact. So we always want to be favoring these plastic looking fruits, but at least they look better than this guy over here. Now, why drugs haven't worked? Well, you'd think, well, can't we just get a drug that'll push this molecule in one direction, the good direction? Well, actually, there's, you know, dozens of factors that influence this molecule. If you just take one biochemical, you know, pathway or, or mechanism out here, you're, you just can't do it because you can't effectively block this going to the so-called bad guy because there's just too many factors. One active ingredient, uh, uh, active ingredient or active um, uh, me method is not going to, to do it. So it's all about balance. I, I think about, this is Ayurveda saying, of course, balance is the key to perfect health. I also think about the work of Dean Ornish and with heart disease and also with prostate cancer, probably about 15 years ago, he did a study on prostate cancer and diet and lifestyle. And what he found was when he applied a specific, you know, anti-inflammatory diet, healthy diet, like healthy lifestyle, stress reduction, and all of that to cancer patients, prostate cancer patients, there were um, dozens of health promoting genes that were turned on and, and many dozens of health or disease promoting that were actually turned off. It was very um, widespread effect on the genome. And I'd say the same thing for what we're learning about the brain and about health in general. It's not just one thing. So the old model is beta amyloid or tau tangles are the cause. It just happens. We don't know why there's no cure and maybe giving drugs like these, these $26,000 a year drugs that get rid of it, beta amyloid, maybe that'll cure it. Well, it, it doesn't. And this is not the first time drugs like that have been used. Now, the prevailing um, integrative approach is no one loses memory for no reason. So if somebody's losing memory, if we look hard enough, we can find modifiable factors that can potentially help them stop the decline and turn it around. So fix enough of them and people get better. So here are a few of the major ones, underlying drivers of this kind of disease type one, inflammation, which in my experience, mostly diet, huge, huge factor for inflammation. Also stress, also things like injuries, uh, but primarily this is very diet modulated. And my patients who come to me and they're following a really healthy, mainly plant-based diet, whole foods is favoring organic, almost always their inflammatory markers are are perfect. They're, they're good. So at least the overt kind that's in the bloodstream. Type 1.5 is sugar, insulin resistance, the whole type 2 diabetes thing. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Type 2 atrophy, meaning just not the hormones and the nutrients that the brain needs to flourish and be um, have growth enhanced versus atrophy or decline. I think of a plant, you know, if you're not giving the plant, you got to give it water. If it's looking a little peaked, you got to give it miracle grow. <laughs> you got to give it nutrients and, and make the soil nourishing. And then the plant starts to grow like crazy. It's, it's a simple analogy, but really we have to give the body enough nutrition and proper nutrition, hormones, et cetera. Type three, toxic. This is a pretty unknown field. 
that those of us doctors who work in this area, we're finding is, is a huge and very challenging area to turn around. But there are people who are getting exposed to mold. Maybe they know it, maybe they don't. Chemicals from the mold, mycotoxins are building up in their system. And they, many of them are neurotoxins. There can be also hidden infections. There can be, you know, even Lyme and uh, herpes virus, you know, used to be syphilis that we were looking for. We still should look for that. Actually, one patient came to me who did, ha did have test positive for that. Chemicals as well. Um, we could go into details. We'd, we want to save time for your questions. Vascular dementia is another thing. You need blood flow to the brain. And if the there's narrowing and a lot of plaque in the arteries and there start to be mini strokes or you lose white matter in the brain, that is a big cause of dementia and traumatic dementia even, um, whether it's PTSD from an emotional trauma, stress, or a physical trauma, you know, head injuries, the, you know, famous kind of football injuries with lots of soccer, lots of trauma to the head. So this precision approach involves, first of all, a lot of blood tests, cog cognoscopy, um, Dr. Bredesen playfully calls it that, uh, and, he, and this would be personalizing diet and eating habits. Some of it's general, but some of it's personalized and supplements also personalized to optimize metabolism. It's as goes metabolism, so goes cognition stress reduction, gut health, uh, optimized hormone levels. If women are very deficient in estradiol, which is a very beneficial hormone for the brain, you know, newer research and further evaluate analysis from the Women's Health Initiative have brought to light a lot of important revelations about safety versus lack of safety of taking hormone therapy hormone replacement after menopause. And in many cases now, uh, certainly doctors working in this field are favoring starting women on these hormones, especially if they have very low levels. Some women will test like non-existent. It doesn't even measure on the uh, blood test. Brain HQ, that's an example of uh, a documented evidence-based brain training online, brainhq.com. Sleep hygiene, sleep is key, physical exercise, probably the most benefits come from that are the most evidence we have are about the benefits of physical exercise. Sleep apnea, treating that. Uh, oxygen to the brain is essential, getting deep sleep and good sleep. And then if, especially if a person shows that they have toxins, removing the toxins, removing exposure to the toxins, the mold, for example, is is critical. Oops. And if there's autoimmunity, that's uh can be a factor in some people as well. So I just wanted to briefly show that women going through menopause, this was um cross-sectional uh groups of women at various ages going through the premenopause to the postmenopause. And you see red is good, red is healthy metabolism, it correlates with good blood flow and oxygen use and and this is a very healthy looking brain you can see just entering perimenopause perhaps the first two three four five years of going through this transition there's a dramatic decline in the amount of of metabolism and then even in the post menopause you can see again some continued decline so some of the research is indicating it may be useful, especially in the perimenopausal time to supplement with hormones. It may prove to be beneficial also for the heart as well as the brain, but they're bioidentical hormones. They're given estradiol only through the skin and progesterone is never given as the medroxyprogesterone, which a lot of the side effects found in women's health initiative were actually attributable to that fake or artificial progesterone. So we see here that men uh, do not go through the same kind of thing. Baseline and three years at those sage age groups look pretty much the same. This is getting near the end here. Top 10 tips for your memory. 
we'll go into some more of this as the questions come up, but generally, you know, the whole food, plant-based diet, fresh fruits and vegetables, berries, olive oil, follow the keto flux. Keto means, yeah, going, not necessarily a super strict keto, but, but at least fasting for 12 hours minimum, no late night snacking, no late night dinners, have at least three hours before you, you go to sleep that you're not consuming any calories. You can drink water or herbal teas, but nothing with calories so that your body can transition into a fasting state more easily and isn't trying to digest and deliver nutrients at a time during sleep when the glymphatic system, the, the glial cells and the lymphatics of the brain are opening up and, and flushing out impurities. We don't want to bring in the groceries when we're trying to clean the kitchen. So reduce and avoid the refined carbs, sugar, everything that will reduce your insulin sensitivity over time. Um, fast at least 12 hours. So from the time you eat your dinner, finish your dinner till you eat in the morning should be at least 12 hours. And depending on your genetics, it may be even beneficial to have it be at least 14 or 16 hours. We can talk a bit about that in a little bit. Eliminate the bad fats and processed foods. And what do we have here? Uh, number five got lost. Um, here we go. Tame your inflammation. Yeah, that healthy diet basically up here. Turmeric can also be of help. Omega-3s can help with that. And exercise. Exercise is the has the most evidence so far for being beneficial. You know, there's lots of studies on it. Some of the most useful I found were one study uh, five or six years ago looked at all sorts of exercise studies on dementia occurrence and incidents, and they found that it did. They said it didn't really matter what type of exercise or the schedule of it, but if the person did a cumulative amount of at least two hours a week that had a beneficial effect. There have been some studies on how many steps a day. Those of you who like aim for 10,000 and get the most of the time, you have a 50% less risk of dementia. And that was a follow-up study of seven years. If you walk with purpose, kind of more fast and quick, you can get away with 6,315. And even 3,800 steps a day just walking around can lower your risk by 25%. Weight training is also highly protective, increases your lean body mass, reduces frailty, which is also a risk factor for Alzheimer's. And it promotes BDNF, which is the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which stimulates the growth of new neurons, which they taught us in medical school quite a while ago that that didn't happen, but now we know it does. We, we create new neurons every day. We're doing something new or exercising. So learning something new is also a fabulous way to promote the growth of new connections and new neurons. And it can be musical instrument. It could be a language. It could be anything that you enjoy. And I was heartened to learn that the studies show you don't have to get good at the language, just trying to learn it helps. So optimize your nutrients and hormone balance. These, these are things that all need to be checked uh, as blood, blood levels. And we're going to talk a little more about thyroid. There were a lot of questions on that. Social contact is and connection is turning out to be a very big factor. And a very interesting study found that of many types of social connection, and even like in a close relationship, that having someone who will give you supportive listening, be a supportive listener that allows you to express yourself and listens in a positive way, that was more powerful even than love and affection. That was really a remarkable finding. So, and, and also just some other practical things, control your blood pressure, take your medication. If you have high blood pressure, even if it's not great, if it's 140 or 145, that's too high. Even 135 in midlife consistently can increase your risk of dementia later in life, not to mention stroke and heart problems. And I added here, avoid anticholinergic medications whenever possible. Acetylcholine is a major neurotransmitter in the brain that's involved in our learning and memory and drugs that interfere with that 
can affect memory. In fact, I had one patient who was so severely reactive and allergic, evidently, I say allergic, not in an immune sense necessarily, but she actually had transient global amnesia from taking a common over-the-counter allergy medicine that was antihistamine and anticholinergic. So Ayurveda, everyone here probably is familiar somewhat with it and beautiful um, tradition of traditional health system of India and meaning really knowledge of life. And I'm going to end with just a little bit, a snippet from one of my patients. This is um, a lady who's a social worker and she came to see me because she was having trouble, starting to have trouble with her cognition. And I'm going to just play a little bit about what she said. The thing was she came to see me and because she knew Ayurveda a bit and she meditated and everything. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to take your pulse. And, you know, I found immediately it was what we would say in Ayurveda, a lot of uh, impurities in the blood and and just uh, aggravated pitta impurities, uh, toxic ama, we could say, a lot of free radicals, a lot of inflammation. And so I said, really, we're going to do all those blood tests and check all your hormones and nutrients and all that. But really, it's really clear already that it must be, you know, your diet needs an overhaul. And she said, I will do whatever you tell me. And I gave her recommendations for uh, some herbs and definitely a dietary overall overhaul. And she followed it. She came back and I asked her, since she had such dramatic results, I asked her if she'd share it and she was happy to do so. So here she's just saying what happened to her. She was a social worker. She was still working full time. She was giving training sessions and she was finding that um, she was forgetting words during trainings, having to ask the, the audience to fill in a word for her. She was having trouble at the computer transferring a few digits to another screen. She would forget in the meantime, she forgot that her she and her daughter had read a book six months ago together, read the whole book, and then she was reading it again. And her daughter said, what are you doing, mom? She didn't remember having read it. So things were definitely going downhill. So this, but I'm going to cut a little bit to the end. And she, this is only from her change in diet when she first came back and lifestyle. Transpose those numbers and the computer from one place to another, I was remembering them rather than having to write them down. It wasn't difficult to remember words anymore um, um, when I was in conversation with family or friends or even in the trainings. And I would just begin to recognize and, and see that. And I was going, this is incredible. This is absolutely incredible. One of the things that I noticed was my sleep patterns. Um, before, um, I would go to bed 10, 10, 30 or night, and I would sleep in the morning until as late as anybody, as long as they left me alone. Um, and then I would wake up um, and I'd be very groggy, um, not alert. And I used to say, I might get up at seven, but um, I'm not awake until about 10 um, because I just didn't have that alertness. But I noticed that I, I was always in bed before 10 um, now. Uh, I wake up at six without an alarm clock. I'm alert. I'm ready to go for the day. And I'm, you know, I'm bright and uh, just so different than the patterns that were there before. So I've seen a lot. My mood has changed. Um, I'm much happier, um, lighter, um, laugh more. Um, not as um, not as dull, I think. I'm much more lucid all the way across so many, so many um, parameters of my life. I'm so thrilled. I had noticed a cog. All right. So I'm going to stop there. We have lots of questions. I'm ha- I'll am i be happy to stay until we get all of them done, whatever it takes. So, Dr. Nancy, thank you so much for your wonderful work. And the, the testimonial there speaks volumes. <laughs> So we will now move to our next segment, and I'm going to invite Anu Shukla, who's a panelist. 
She's a parallel entrepreneur and also a health tech enthusiast. So Anu, over to you. And Anu is uh, going to, um, um, you know, uh, post questions that we have gathered uh, from um, all the emails that we had received. So over to you, Anu. Thank you so much. Um, I said uh, thank you, Ira, Iru, and uh, welcome, Dr. Nancy. It's such a pleasure to watch your uh, presentation. It's eye opener, and uh, I'm just fascinated and really interested in following up. We have a lot of questions, and I keeping time in mind. I know we touched on diabetes. That was my question: How does diabetes affect? And we touched on insulin. And we also touched on um, thyroid. Um, and so those are some of our questions. So let me get to some that we didn't touch on. And then if we have time, I'll come back to the ones uh, about how thyroid affects. Uh, so the, the, the one that we didn't talk about uh, yet uh, is, um, is, is a question from the audience, which is what are the tools to improve cognitive abilities post stroke? Mm. Um, this yeah, is very, this is very near and dear to me because my mother had a, a small stroke as well. So, yes, um, some of the research on that shows that actually another question on this about yeah one technology, but I'll just say in general early rehabilitation that includes cognitive training from the very beginning is key. Like um, I found an article a research. Uh, it actually came out of China and they said that they have 80% of their patients from stroke do not regain independent living. Whereas in the U S 80% do. And I thought that was huge. And it, it mirrors what I saw 30 some years ago when I did neurology rotation at Stanford is it was like, if somebody had a stroke, the neurologist come by and it's almost like, well, I'm really sorry this happened. There's nothing we can do for you. But in the last 10 or 15 years, I've seen patients of mine and um, friends or, or who had stroke, and they got tremendous amount of rehab and they're walking around. You would not even know some of these people had strokes and they were not able to walk. They could barely talk afterwards. So rehab is tremendous. The neuroplasticity of the brain and its ability if with a lot of work. It's a lot of work. They all described how many hours they would spend every day and how determined they had to be to recover. But, you know, they did. It was very impressive. Okay, that, that is very good to know. And um, is, it, uh, is it time related? Just a follow-up question. Like, do you have to do it right away? Is that the most beneficial that you... Um, probably, yeah, early. They talk about early. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't think any time is too late. You know, if it, it, we still have neuroplasticity, you know, but I think in the early, early time, the faster you get started, the more, you know, faster your results. I don't know about the studies on like, comparing starting on the first week versus a year later. Usually, it, usually the neurological things is best to start within the year if possible, but okay. earlier. Right. Um, uh, this is a very interesting question. It's a little bit different from any topics we've covered. And it says, uh, audience question, it says, I had uh, COVID pneumonia and was in life support for two months and another month in rehab. I sometimes forget words or I might think of words that mean the same, but it isn't the word I'm looking for. Uh, I'm taking supplements, but wondering what other advice I could seek. I thought this is very timely because COVID, in the big, large scheme of things, COVID just happened. And so anybody who got COVID and has memory issues, I think that might be the cutting edge work that is still going on. But I wonder if you can ponder on the, this question. Um, well, there are some things that have been found to help. There's, they're, they're still investigating this. And they're finding that, yes, inflammation and sort of uh, maybe a dysregulated immune response to that, uh, whether it's the virus at the time or somehow it's persisting, even though the virus is gone. Now, recently, they just published that they've found evidence of spike protein that can be 
remaining as a residue in the brain that could be as mm -hmm. highly immunogenic. So um, they're finding that the inflammation in long COVID, those kinds of symptoms can be very similar to chronic fatigue syndrome and chemotherapy brain, so to speak. And they feel it has to do a lot with inflammation. So I suppose everything anti-inflammatory can help. There is also some, this um, enhanced uh, external, I just learned about it today because somebody asked about it. It was pretty, very interesting, but it's a type of um, methodology to increase the blood flow to the brain and to the heart. And it involves just simple thing. The person goes and lies on the table and they inflate like blood pressure cuffs, like on the legs, all the way up to the, the hips. And it causes the bl blood flow, it lowers the resistance when the heart is pumping forward and it um, helps to prevent the excess of back flow that can happen during diastolic. So it, it enhances blood flow and that seems to be helping. It was helpful for post-COVID syndrome and it also can be helpful post-stroke. So that was another thing. Both of those, they seem to be quite decent clinical studies on that. So I think that's a wonderful a kind of non-invasive way to increase blood flow. I mean, there is hyperbaric oxygen that's been touted for quite a long time as being potentially helpful after stroke and also perhaps could help with, I don't know if any studies on post-COVID uh, brain fog, but it does have potentially some side effects and it's expensive. and. Um, mm. Okay. Not all so easy to to get get not so accessible, and Medicare doesn't pay for it. I don't know if they pay for this this technique or not, but but there are things, and they're really working on it. There's there's research going on to see what will help, but certainly good anti-inflammatory diet and exercise and sleep and you know giving your brain rest and and trying not to freak out when that happens because the anxiety of or upset that you can't find it that directly immediately impacts the hippocampal function. So uh, I've, I've had a lot of patients who are recovering from maybe TBI, um, traumatic brain injury, even just, you know, badly hitting their head. And they, they may go through a period of a year or two or three as things are gradually getting better. It can be a slow process. But most of those people have said, look, I've just learned to relax when I can't remember something because mm -hmm. then it comes more quickly. I just relax and then let it come. So. Okay. Um, well, my third question, I, I think I'm only allowed to ask four, Dr. Nancy. <laughs> so I'm I'm taking all the audience questions because I know they were interested. And if, if, if you could set this up by just telling us a little, we assuming everybody knows what a keto diet is. But if you just briefly tell us what is a keto diet and also can it prevent dementia? Yes, a uh, keto diet in short is, uh, the background is our brain and body has the ability to either burn a uh, glucose as fuel or byproducts of fat, well, small called keto bodies, ketone bodies. It's like, a hybrid car. It can run on gas, which is oxidative and actually kind of dirty and, and maybe, you know, pollutes, or it can run on electricity. And the ketones are like electricity to the brain. I mean, they are cleaner burning fuel. They don't create the same kind of oxidative stress. So it turns out that it is quite a healing type of diet to, in order to get your body switch to keto burning, one has to fast certain number of hours, and then one has to restrict carbohydrates, total carbohydrates in a day, usually to less than 50, sometimes even less than that. But the interesting thing is, I'll just speak to people who already have some degree of dementia, mild cognitive impairment or, or, or Alzheimer's, is that the research so far seems to indicate that following the diet, plus taking a supplement of ketones, like um, that has the, the biggest or the most reliable benefit. And 
so there, there are kind of protocols on how you can take ketones in between your meals or maybe like coconut oil even is, is has rich in um, medium chain triglycerides, which promote and help the body and brain make more ketones. So, um, so that's the diet. Well, I wasn't able to find anything that said they had tested keto diet for prevention. There wasn't any data that I could find on prevention, but it has been useful in people who do have it. Um, but maybe perhaps more useful in people who don't have the the ApoE4, which is the genetic marker for it. Um, that was just a finding in one study. I think it would have to be researched further, but. Okay. And, and finally, the last question, I'll get back to the, the question on thyroid. Um, so the question was really, if you're taking thyroid, you have a thyroid issue, you're taking a supplement, like how do you prevent uh, the deterioration of, of the brain health? Well, basically, if you're taking your medication and you're keeping your thyroid levels in a good place, then you shouldn't have deterioration. Okay. And, you know, and the TSH thyroid stimulating hormone is coming from the brain. So if it's normal, it means the brain's pretty happy with that amount of thyroid hormone. So okay. I think, I don't think you have to have a long-term and it, it, it's good that you visit your doctor once a year or every other year and get blood tests so that you don't go a long time with something undiagnosed that could potentially maybe injure the brain and maybe will reverse. Um, often the brain can recover, you know, but maybe it won't just like B12 deficiency. Other also extremely important, especially for many of you who may be vegans and even even lacto-vegetarians and even non-vegetarians can get low in B12. It's quite more common than we thought and even in younger ages. So get ask your doctor to check your B12 level if you're not taking a supplement. And if you are taking a supplement, ask it anyway, because maybe you're taking too much. There's an, you know, no need to have it in the many thousands. But if, if you're not taking it, you should have it checked, but don't take a tablet before you go to your blood test because it'll artificially bring it up right away. You won't know. Okay. But 12 is a huge factor in memory and cognitive problems in vegetarians. In my experience, because I've had mostly vegetarian patients of some sort. And it's especially even in younger people. Somebody asked, what are the causes in young adults like those below 40. And I would say B12 is a big one. And even like iron deficiency can be, that can reduce productivity and mental acuity and energy. Thyroid, if it's too low, can cause memory loss. Actually, I had a professor once who shared his medical story with me. And he said that um, he went to the doctor. I was in medical school. He said, I went to the doctor the other day because I was in a meeting and I forgot a word. And I looked at him like, <laughs> what? You forgot a word? So big deal. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> that could happen to me or, or so many personalities, you know, even at age 10 or 20. But he, that's, that was abnormal for him. And he said, I have low thyroid. So I'll never forget that story because I was shocked, but it, 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 was, it was how it manifested for him. And hyperthyroid can also get underdiagnosed. Yeah. It often will cause a sleep problem. People just think they have insomnia. So, and then sleep disorder, of course, disturbs memory and cognition. So be sure you're getting your thyroid checked, especially women more prone to those kinds of conditions. All right, that was wonderful. I got through my questions, um, my quota. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Ro, to get our next panelist uh, asking you questions. Thank you so much, uh, Anu. And Dr. Nancy, I have to say you would intrigue so much interest. <laughs> we have more questions uh, coming in and we're going to try our best to accommodate um, as many as we can. And before I invite our next uh, panelist, I just would like to invite our audience that in the chat box, you will see Dr. Nancy is... Um, um, uh, she's hosting a webinar and the link is posted in the chat. So if you guys would like to uh, save the link um, and it's our gift to us. So we're so grateful um, for this online course and webinar. 
Um, and also, uh, we have posted uh, a link for uh, donations to CWC, uh, because your donations help us uh, bring uh, these valuable um, events uh, to the audience, um, but with the technology, our on-site programs, and more. Um, so I uh, just wanted to share that. And now I would like to invite Akshaya Ramakrishna. She is a student, global health student at Case Western and also an intern uh, at CWC. So over to you, Akshaya. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Iru. Um, and also, thank you so much, Dr. Nancy. It was an amazing presentation. And I think all of us got such great information. Um, I think I'm also supposed to limit to four questions. Um, so I'm going to try to pick the most important ones that I have here. Um, but the first question that we have from another registrant is, how is the modern environment that we're living in right now impacting our memory, especially um, with all the information that we're being bombarded with, you know, on a daily basis from different sources, you know, from other people, our family members, and mainly the internet, we're getting so much information on various topics. So how do you think that this information bombardment is impacting our memory? Um. It's interesting. I did do some research on that as well. And it's definitely creating fatigue, you know, information fatigue and overload. And I don't know if it's really causing memory problems, but one of the highly cited causes is the interruptions and the multitasking and the distracting. So when one can eliminate those as best you can and really focus on one thing. They haven't really found that memory is deteriorated, but it's this it's this kind of thing that prevents you know us from learning as well or quickly and make retaining perhaps what we were reading because we're getting interrupted. So yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and we have another question here that's uh, more specific um, to the specific registrant. But um, the question is, so one of this session's registrant's father has dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, and so the question is, can one take preventative steps now to reduce the likelihood of developing a similar condition? Yeah, there, Lewy body dementia is not thought to be really hereditary and most people do not end up you know they usually there's one person in the family it's kind of not uh running in the family so I don't think they have to be particularly concerned although it does what Lewy body it involves much of the pathology that's there in the brain for Alzheimer's as well as of the buildup of synuclein clumps within the cells that's the same protein that builds up uh one of the main ones in Parkinson's. So I, doc, I I think that the researchers today, they're trying to see, and Dr. Bredesen with his work is trying to see if this kind of protocol will work with patients with Lewy body disease, but they haven't had enough of them and studied them enough to see. So I think the main thing would be just to do all the healthy things for your brain. And, you know, there, there is the question of heredity. I, I do want to mention, somebody had asked um, before, you know, is there a way to see what your risk is of Alzheimer's? And it's a, there is a genetic a marker called APOE4, which is not really a marker for Alzheimer's, but it does, it does predict risk. And people with that allele, the four for the APOE gene, it, they can more easily develop lipid accumulations in the brain and the cells. And they also may be more prone to inflammatory inflammation of the brain. So, and other places, because they also get cardiovascular disease more easily. So I would say that the useful thing about that, and I was encouraged that it's good to know, not because you have to live in fear. Oh no, this is coming to me. It's it's not, it's an epigenetic phenomenon, but it means that you have to do extra work and should know so that you really are motivated to eat that right food and to put the sugar aside and to not have the French fries or the, the things that are gonna increase inflammation and to exercise and get enough sleep. 
but it's a, it's, it can be empowering because you know there are things that you can do to prevent. And there is there's um there's a website called apoe4.info and Julia Gregory I think is her name Julie Gregory she she actually recovered herself from starting to go down the Alzheimer's direction and she has both copies she's got the dual copy which increases Alzheimer's risk by 12 times or more it's like a 50 percent chance of getting Alzheimer's if you have both alleles the four number so she developed uh, she created a whole support group and resources online to share her experience and empower other people to have the same benefits she did from everything she did in her lifestyle yeah, that's really interesting. I think we can also include that link in the chat so people can access um, the website. Um, but another question that we have related to the previous ones is, and I think you covered some of the preventative Did ways. I wanna, excuse me, just I want to make sure oh, I said yes. apoe4 with uh -huh. a four dot info. Apoe Apo and then, yeah, apoe4 dot info. Are there any caps in that or is it all lowercase? Um, the, the E is capitalized. Okay, so apo E4. Dot, dot info. Dot info, okay. Okay, awesome. Um, so moving on to the next question, which is similar to the previous one and related to it. And I think you did cover some of the preventative ways, but what are the preventative ways to um, arrest cognitive decline? And is there a test to diagnose the probability of getting Alzheimer's? Yeah, I think it's, it's the APOE4. You okay. know, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of the genetic, it'll give you a genetic risk okay. of getting it. Um, on the other hand, if you have neither copy F4 and you have a terrible lifestyle, mm -hmm. you know, you may very well be heading down that road even more than somebody with one or two copies of the APOE4. So in fact, people without E4, they're more likely to have the toxic form, which is a little more challenging to treat. Okay. Um, and then we have a more specific question, but um, how can dementia patients, you know, who are 80 years and older uh, be helped in keeping their mind healthy and you know, ensuring that they don't have any cognitive or functional decline and ensuring improvement in brain health? Well, ensure is a pretty challenging word because we don't know, but, you know, that can, that employs everything that we know now that could help. I think it's never too late to have a, a healthy whole food plant-based anti-inflammatory diet. Mm -hmm. You know, whether they go into a keto type diet or not, it's, at 88, I probably wouldn't do something that extreme, uh, especially if they're not particularly mm -hmm. uh, clear mentally, but social contact can be huge. And I've seen older um, individuals with Alzheimer's who were very sweet and very calm and not agitated and that they were actually kind of, they were work for their pay, their family, but they were quite a joy as well. And they were usually meditating to keep their stress down. They enjoyed that and doing things with them and even just bringing out scrapbooks and, and mem you know, have sharing memories or letting them talk and just the supportive listening. There was a very interesting finding on supportive listening is that that was the one social interaction that was associated with cognitive resilience, which they defined as for a given amount of atrophy of the brain, those people had more than expected cognitive ability. Mm -hmm. So yeah, supportive listening can be huge and not challenging them, just trying to keep the stress levels down in the interactions. Uh, exercise can be of help to them too and getting outside and sunlight. And then you can also do the, the protocol of blood testing, the mm -hmm. cognoscopy, so to speak. Um, I have a, I have a, I posted that list, the healthy brain solution.com I believe. So you can download that and take it to your doctor and ask for them to do as many of those tests as, you know, 
they will. They won't usually do them all, especially if you're at Kaiser, but you know, it's possible that you can get quite a bit of it covered by your insurance. Yeah. Yeah, it is it is the the word the is in there. Okay. Uh what's the website link again? This uh, one. The healthy brain solution.com. And are there any caps in that? Uh no. By the way, the um the link they sent was to the my online course, which will have a live webinar series as part of it. But mm -hmm. there is also a webinar um that's just an introductory one that everyone's welcome to come to. Or if you have a family member that you think would like to, you know, might like to hear about it, we can see about sending that link out afterwards. Yeah, sure, definitely. Um, and then kind of moving into sort of different topic. Um, and this was like a personal question that I had, and we also kind of discussed this in our call previously, but, you know, in the gut brain access, you know, the gut microbiome, as, as we know, can influence the production of several important neurotransmitters in our body, like serotonin, dopamine, GABA, which all play a really vital role in regulating our mood and overall behavior and cognition. And you did go over, you know, a few lifestyle changes at the end of your presentation, but you know, what other medical interventions can be made in conjunction with the infusion of Ayurvedic medical practices and also our modern medicine practices um, to bring back a positive balance of microbiota and prevent the onset of certain neurogenerative diseases that we discuss, like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease? Yeah, I think I think it's an open question still, and that it probably needs a lot of research. But, the, you know, in theory, there are certain uh, bacteria that are uh, whose lack is associated with increased risk of Parkinson's, for example. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we don't know, but perhaps supplementing with those particular bacteria uh, will be helpful. Okay. And, you know, the problem is getting bacteria to really colonize and stay there. If you're taking a probiotic mm -hmm. and then prebiotic and it's having a good prebiotic kind of diet with lots of legumes and things with different types of fiber and fruits and vegetables. Basically, we don't, we're not, we weren't born to need a lot of supplements, but, you know, it's our modern lifestyle and the lack of nutrition and food today that may make that and, and many antibiotic treatments mm -hmm. that may make yeah. that necessary. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but I think I always, I always try first Ayurvedic things mm -hmm. or, well, if they have a lot of GI symptoms like gas or bloating and such, I usually address it Ayurvedically and I may check a microbiome kind of panel to just see if some of the major uh, beneficial bacteria are absent and suppl start supplementing that as well. Okay. Oh yeah. Awesome. So that's all the questions that I had as part of my section. So I think I'll hand it over to Iru now for the rest of the questions. Thank you so much, Akshaya, for all, uh, asking all the valuable questions. And thank you so much, Dr. Nancy, for so patiently and kindly <laughs> helping all of us. We're so grateful. Um, so I am now also going to be asking some questions that we received um, uh, via email. And I'm also going to ask the questions that we are now receiving in our live chat. Uh, let me first start with the email, um, the questions we received via email. Uh, the first question is, would you recommend external counter pulsation method to enhance blood flow to the brain. Well, in the 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 articles that I found with where they tested it on particular conditions, like they tested it on the long COVID conditions, symptoms, and post-stroke, the results were very good and really no no significant side effects. So I would say definitely, but I don't think it's something. It shouldn't be one's first line of like, oh, I want to improve blood flow to my brain. Let me go do that. I mean, if you're a healthy person, you don't need to go do that. But there are things, you know, besides just exercise alone increases blood flow. And even meditation, like transcendental meditation, cerebral blood flow to the frontal and the occipital cortex, both are increased during the practice. So I think, you know, probably there are a lot of things that 
are should be doing anyway that are going to help and it you know that's a procedure you'd have to go and it probably takes at least an hour or so and go 20 30 times you know if you're not well it's worth it and probably expensive but if not then just increase your blood pressure your brain perfusion some other way but i was i was fascinated to hear about it i was very um glad somebody asked about that Thank you so much. And I'm so glad that you also, um, you know, touched upon transcendental meditation, because that was also one of our questions. Um, so you, I'll, you I'll mention a couple other things. I mean, there's research on transcendental meditation that it's correlated with, you know, lower oxidative stress, uh, better metabolic, uh, less metabolic syndrome, probably because less cortisol. Um, people practicing TM, just starting college students, they compare with a control and three months later that cortisol is in a more optimal range. So cortisol is a huge influence stress, especially, you know, that's one of the mediators of stress physiologically is that hormone is directly toxic to the hippocampus in excess. And it can set up a vicious cycle. The hippocampus actually helps turn the stress like stress response off. And if the hippocampus gets damaged, then one can be cycling in, in kind of a constant stress mode. So it's really important to when the younger you are, you know, to, to incorporate habits that reduce the impact of stress on the body because it's cumulative. I completely agree. <laughs> and um, I have some personal experiences to validate that as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, this is also a question um, via email, and there were some interests online uh, on the live chat as well um, about um, Ayurvedic herbs um, and uh, prescriptions, uh, you know, uh, generally speaking. Um, uh, to to maintain uh, healthy memory and to prevent memory loss. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think, you know, we all want a magic pill and I'm not against herbs. I love, I love herbs and I take, take them as much as I can. <laughs> I, I do, I do um, feel that they're very beneficial. And some of the kind of superstars for brain health, supporting memory, learning, and uh, for their antioxidant effects, even anti-amyloid effects in animal studies are ashwagandha, which also has been shown to calm the nervous system. So it's not, it's also antioxidant. It helps to calm the immune system. So it helps fight excessive inf inflammation. So I would say that would be a really good one. There's some evidence that it may increase uh, or support acetylcholine as well. And that's that neurotransmitter having to do with memory. And the drugs that they give for Alzheimer's, most of them are anticholinesterases. So they block the degradation of acetylcholine to try to increase them in the, in the brain and in the synapses. But as I said, it only works well for a limited time. It also some evidence that it helps uh, neurite formation, like connections to go out from the neurons to sprout new axons and uh, or dendrites and such. So that's one of the things. Um, turmeric, fantastic. Um, there's 4.4 times less Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's in Southeast Asians, especially in villagers who haven't adopted uh, like a McDonald's lifestyle. <laughs> so they're eating, you know, home cooked food with lots of turmeric. And it's, it's a very powerful anti-inflammatory and, and antioxidant and seems to have a direct effect to re reduce the formation of amyloid plaque, which is coming from immune response, over response of the immune system. So Bacopa also is another one, Brahmi. Uh, Brahmi is a generic term. Sometimes it's used for Gotula, Centella asiatica, as well as Bacopa manieri. But Bacopa manieri is the, according to the my my Vija mentors say, that's the real, that's the real Brahmi. And Bacopa has been shown to also increase memory and support learning and cognition, and to reduce 
the degeneration of acetylcholine and production in the brain. It reduces free radicals. So there's a lot of overlap here, but Bacopa, I think if you were to take just two herbs, Bacopa, you know, or three, Bacopa, turmeric, ashwagandha um, are, are three of the best. And go to cola for focus. Good, good, good research on that as well. Besides, it helps collagen. So every woman should be taking it anyway, right? <laughs> Uh, just to follow up, so the, um, uh, the the ashwagandha and the brahmi that you talked about, so is that, uh, you know, uh, something that anybody can take without uh, c consulting and uh, just follow uh, the, you know, uh, the prescription on the bottle or? Well, you know, generally, if somebody's healthy and doesn't take medication and isn't known to have any health problems, yes. But if you're taking a medication, particularly maybe for the heart or blood pressure or arrhythmias or anything blood thinning, you should definitely talk to your doctor before you add an herb. And they, in all good conscience, they should look up that herb and see if it influences the degradation or the metabolism of the drug that the person's taking or may have an action that's not so good. Like they're on a blood thinner, you don't wanna take herbs with strong blood thinning effects. Yeah, got it. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, this question is my question. Uh, and from my own personal experiences, uh, you know, um, I realized that uh, the mindset, our attitude, our uh, emotions, they play a huge role. And if you could, um, you know, um, uh, elaborate um, on that because our limited uh, belief systems, they hold us back. So how can integrative medicine practices, including Ayurveda, help us identify and overcome these mental roadblocks <clears throat> and what impact can they have on our cognitive function and memory? Thank you. Yes, I think to the degree that they create stress, you know, um, from the anxiety, excess fear, trouble making the decisions, um, you know, excess fear, anxiety is associated generally with a more cortisol. So, and often can disturb our sleep if one's worrying a lot and waking up and such. So it's a really great question. I think we all have to address that in our lives from time to time. And some people, you know, more than others, but um, there's a term in Ayurveda, I think I'm going to refer to that first, it is called Pragya Aprad, and it means, it's been translated as mistake of the intellect or mistaken intellect, and I've been involved in coaching healthcare workers in a Department of Defense study the last couple of years, and I have a, um, somebody I coach with, and, and basically coaching, in my, my opinion, is very compatible with this Ayurvedic understanding of mistake of the intellect, because what we find is that there are these patterns that often we don't see. So we have to learn how to question ourselves. Um, and if it's a, a really stuck issue, then having somebody who can ask you the hard questions or the questions we would never think to ask ourselves. So inquiry is a really important thing. And I, I was asked to, um, when we talked the other night to give some, some, you know, maybe some steps or some things that somebody could do themselves. So I would just say that one thing that we, we taught our healthcare workers in some of the group sessions that we had were some basic ways of processing when they were found an issue that they were dealing with that was upsetting, for example, you know, first of all, is just to name the emotion. When we actually have to reflect and say, yeah, what is the emotion? What am I feeling? The brain immediately, you can see it on fMRI, it dramatically changes the amygdala, which is, you know, having to do with it, stress, anger, anxiety, that activity calms down right away. And there's activity in the right frontal cortex, which increases. So there's, there's a shift to the cortex, which is the CEO of the brain. It gets us somehow it really right away dampens down the emotional stress just by identifying it saying, well, humiliation, well, 
or, or uh, I felt threatened or I felt I f- anger, it's anger, you know? And, and, then, and then one can ask, you know, well, what about it, you know, makes you angry? Well, if you're just telling a story to somebody, you know, they're going to say, well, yeah, I'd feel the same way. You know, you're talking to your friend. They say, yeah, I can't believe your boss said that. Oh, that's so wrong. Right. Even therapists do that a lot. You know, they just empower that, but it doesn't really get us out of it. But what gets us out of it is breaking this Pragya Parad through inquiring like, well, like what exactly about it made you angry, makes you angry. And having to stop and think about it, like instead of, we, we call it inquiry into the obvious. It, it actually also just kind of opens up some of the awareness and, and, and it dissipate, this emotional stress will dissipate. So that's another one. And also like, well, what meaning am I giving it that I get angry? Well, that he doesn't respect me, that he, I'm under, I'm not appreciated. You know, he doesn't appreciate what I do or, um, or maybe, maybe I'm going to get fired, you know? So just articulating and distinct, distinguishing what is going on on these levels. Uh, another thing can be, you know, what am I saying about myself in regard to that? Like, well, if I say, I say, well, he doesn't respect me, you know, that's what I, the meaning I'm giving it is my boss doesn't respect me. Well, the fear behind it is really that I'm not respectable. So what I'm saying to myself is I'm not respectable. And we one starts to see how one's giving one's assessment of oneself to what the other person is saying or how they behave. And it begins to kind of open up the mind to new ways of looking at it. It's a process. It doesn't even happen in an hour usually. I mean, things can, a certain degree it can happen within a few minutes where one feels a lot more relieved. And then if one has a deep or really stuck problem and, and something, it can take hours. We just, we just coach over time and gradually all these things um, become dissipated. So it's, it's really an ability that our mind has when it's, when it's just like meditation. We never think to transcend, you know, that's the ultimate, uh, ultimate uh, dissipation of Pragya Parad because we go beyond the intellect and we just experience that inner peace. And that's beautiful. But if we come out and we're still upset about the boss, then we kind of recreate that whole physiology of stress again, right? So, so we have to kind of do both things. You know, we, we dissipate it and the physiology gets us deep rest and healing. But when we come out, we also have to kind of get rid of the whatever the assumptions and the paradigms and the ways we're looking at it in the background of our mind that are actually, you know, damaging us and causing the emotions. So it's, it's very fascinating. I found it to be a missing link from my practice in the first maybe 20 years in the last 12 years or so. It's been a very helpful. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Dr. Nancy. I'm just looking at the time. Um, we have a couple questions. Maybe we uh, would you be okay if we got uh, covered a couple more from the live? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if the audience, um, uh, yeah, if if you guys are able to stay back, we are going to try our best. So thank you so much once again. Um, so uh, we did. Um, you did mention one of your websites, and I'm wondering if this question would be answered there. So, uh, Jayshree would uh, like to know uh, how can we find out the inflammation number? What test do we ask our doctor? Um, mm-hmm. And uh, what can we get done to check the BHRT? Um, and does cholesterol medicine affect the cholerogenic? Um, uh, medicine that you talked about? That's a really good question. Um, for the, the hormones, you can just have your doctor basically test estradiol. Estradiol is the most potent estrogen. There are three different types that we have, and it seems to be the most important for brain. It's a growth factor and support for the brain. So serum estradiol, I mean, if it comes back and it's less than five, I'd say that's a real danger zone. That's like you basically don't have any. Say this, we're talking about a postmenopausal woman. And that's that's going to lead to, you know, starvation of the tissues to some degree. 
from not having any, because there are women after menopause who can have, I've seen as high as 29. You know, there's a big difference between nothing and 29. <laughs> Even 10 may be protective. And actually I saw research one time that if it's, if it's five, at least five, then you, it has some bone protective effects as well. So probably, you know, even a little bit can be helpful. I, I don't get my patients up into high, high ranges at all. There's all sorts of, you got to be careful. Don't go to clinics where they do these pellets. You get hundreds, your estradiol goes to the hundreds, testosterone goes to the hundreds. It's, it's very non-physiological and I'm sure it's really not good for you, but you know, you want to do it intelligently and have it followed and match it to what a person's, you know, experience is, what's getting better, what hasn't helped. Okay, thank you so much. I'll just ask one last question and then invite the panelists uh, for a closure. And uh, since we're talking about the test, what would be the best test for detecting early onset of Alzheimer's? Um, there is a genetic, there is a genetic test. Uh, there's, there is a a very rare form that gives early Alzheimer's that's inherited, but it's very rare. So I would just mostly encourage the people that if you think, oh no, you know, you're young and you think, oh, am I getting Alzheimer's? No, look to all these other lifestyle factors is very rare, you know, and you would know it, it runs in your family and it runs young and all that. Okay. So I'd say, you know, look to these other factors. Thank you so much, Dr. Nancy. At this time, I would like to invite Anu and Akshaya. Um, and uh, if they have any, uh, you know, final uh, uh, comments, final feedback. And um, I also would like to remind one more time about Dr. Nancy's uh, link that has been posted in the chat about her webinar. And also uh, the donation link, um, as we mentioned, we heavily rely on that uh, to scale our events and more. And also do not forget to download the Cushy app. Um, that is how we can all stay connected and give each other uh, support. And uh, yeah, and uh, if there are no more um uh, uh, no more uh, uh, feedback uh, from them, then uh, Dr. Nancy, would you have any closing remarks uh, for us uh, tonight? You've been so kind and patient. We're so grateful. Oh, it's been a pleasure, really. You guys are all wonderful and I love your mission. And I actually tried to sign, I did sign up for um, your membership and I didn't find it. Somebody had suggested that I join their wellness uh, support group for women, but I wasn't able to figure out how to do that. So I just invite you to <laughs> tell me the steps or something. But I, I, I'll just say, you know, it's just like everything else. We'd like it to be simple, but we, ha we have to find that balance in our life. We have to create it as, you know, to the degree we can more and more Then we're more and more protected from Alzheimer's and strokes and heart attacks and everything. Um, but we have to do it. And I'm just hoping that you're all motivated and inspired that it really makes a difference. And even if you feel like your cognition isn't as good as it used to be, you still, if you make some changes, you might get uh, largely back. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nancy. We'll definitely be getting in touch with you to help you uh, connect uh, in the support group for sure. And um, um, for those uh, of us uh, who have signed up, you will also be receiving a, a video, on-demand video, uh, shot after uh, this event. So feel free to share and invite uh, uh, your friends and family so they can all avail these wonderful resources. Um, and with that, Dr. Nancy, thank you so much for dedicating your life for helping us all be healthier. And uh, we can only imagine, um, uh, you know, what it must be to, uh, to have a, a condition like this and how it impacts not just their life, uh, you, you know, but the lives of people around them. So we are so grateful for all the work you've been doing and your dedication and everybody else in the field. 